welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews, we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime, and I'm really looking forward to another individual study with you today focused on Al Capone's top hitman, Jack McGurn. I've had several requests to cover McGurn in the past, and especially after the St. Valentine's Day massacre coverage. Despite McGurn's notoriety, even reaching the status of public enemy number four in Chicago, McGurn's history is very mysterious and there is not a lot of solid information about him, but I have found several pieces of information that seem to be thread across multiple sources. So I'm going to do my best to get you through that logically today. We have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Vincenzo Antonio Gibaldi was born on July 2nd, 1902. Some reports say 1903 in Licata, Sicily. He was the eldest son of Tommaso and Giuseppe Gibaldi. He and his family immigrated to the United States and arrived at Ellis Island on November 24th, 1906. When McGurn was very young, some reports say as early as three years old, his father was killed by gunmen who worked for William J or Wild Bill Lovett, an Irish gangster dubbed by the media as the leader of the White Hand Gang, the Irish equivalent to the Italian La Mano Nera, or Black Hand Extortion and Murder Gang. Most reports maintain that the murder of Tommaso Gibaldi was senseless because the gunman mistook him for someone else. It is often claimed that Gibaldi was mistaken for somebody in Frankie Yale's gang, but I don't think that makes a lot of sense given the timeline. Yale, who was born in 1893, would not have been old enough to really have a gang in place. However, like I said, the timeline for McGurn is extremely murky, so it's possible that the difference of a few years could put Yale's gang into the equation. Other reports claim that Gibaldi died of natural causes. In any case, the family moved to Chicago and Giuseppe Gibaldi was soon married to a man named Angelo DeMora, and DeMora would take on a fatherly role for the young Jack McGurn. DeMora opened a grocery business in Chicago's Little Italy. His stepson would begin his boxing career in 19 1921 and continue it through 1923, where he would take on the name of Battling Jack McGurn. Having an Irish name meant that McGurn would be booked for better fights. At the time, it was more profitable to be an Irish boxer than an Italian one. Throughout the majority of McGurn's young life, he was not involved in crime, which is amazing to think about given the breakneck speed with which he rose in the criminal ranks. McGurn was a boxer and had every intention of making that his livelihood. In fact, it's very likely that Al Capone, a boxing enthusiast, was first made aware of McGurn due to his boxing, not his criminal capability. This all changed in 1923. Angelo de Mora had succumbed to the siren song of the earning potential offered to him by involvement in the bootlegging business. He began selling sugar to the Jaina family, a crew led by the Jaina brothers and heads of the Alki racket, or the alcohol and bootlegging racket, for the area. The deal with the Jainas did make de Mora a lot of money, but when the Jaina brothers found out that de Mora was selling sugar to competitive bootleggers, they mocked him publicly, calling him a nickel and dimer before having him killed. Angelo de Mora was shot and killed on January 28th, 1923. Some sources claim that McGurn first joined the North Side Gang at this point, but most evidence suggests that he became involved in Capone's South Side Gang in his mission to avenge the death of his stepfather, whom he loved dearly. The Jaina brothers had a bit of an on-again, off-again relationship with the South Side Gang. The Jainas were enemies of the North Siders, and so for Capone and several of the South Siders, the Jaina family was viewed more as enemies of our enemies rather than their friends. It is widely accepted that Angelo Jaina was killed on May 26, 1925 in a high-speed chase by a vehicle full of armed Northsiders following the murder of Dean O'Banion, the inciting incident that would create the bloody war between the North and South Sides, which would culminate in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. However, a counter theory holds that Al Capone was responsible for the Angelo Jaina hit. The theory maintains that the hit was ordered after Jaina made a pass for the leadership of the Unione Siciliana following the death of their leader, Mike Merlo. Unione Siciliana is the political influence group which was led by Mike Merlo, a friend of Capone and the South Side, that controlled much of the Italian vote in the early 20th century. According to this theory, Capone had McGurn, now in his employ, along with others, track down and murder Angela Jaina. After the murder, Capone fed the message to the press about this being a North Sider hit. This theory also has some timeline issues. McGurn's tracking down and murder of the four hitmen responsible for his stepfather's death by 1926 is what is said by most historians to be what caught Capone's eye in the first place. It wouldn't make sense for him to be at such a trusted level before 1926 without Capone. Also, fun fact, Jack McGurn left a nickel in all of the men's hands who had murdered his stepfather to send a message about having called him a nickel and dimer. Later, this would go on to be McGurn's calling card. 
Apparently, while under the alias of James Gebbard on March 29th, 1926, an attempt was made on McGurn's life, but he would give no explanation to police regarding why people would be shooting at him. McGurn would go on to work under one of Al Capone's men, Claude Screwy Moore Maddox, and proved himself to be such a capable enforcer and bodyguard due to his athletic regimen that Al Capone built gyms in the Metropole and Lexington hotels to force his bodyguards to use. And while it would seem that Al Capone did not hit the gym much himself, he did see the value in having an athletic group of men to protect him, and Jack McGurn would soon become his very favorite. In addition to his physique, McGurn was a bit of a renaissance man and very particular about his wardrobe. He was a terrific golfer. He even had plans to go pro, a horseman, a ukulele player, a smooth dancer, and of course, gunslinger. McGurn was nicknamed Machine Gun before the more popular Machine Gun Kelly. His competence in so many areas and handsome appearance drew comparisons to Jay Gatsby, the titular character of the 1925 classic The Great Gatsby. Unlike Gatsby, however, McGurn did get married. This was not a match made in heaven, however, McGurn and his first wife, Helen, would wind up divorced. More on this a little later. According to one story from comedian Eddie Cantor, McGurn was very laid back. Cantor had a run-in with McGurn after a group of men tried to shake him down while claiming to be part of the Al Capone gang. In the story, Cantor was harassed to pay $25,000 by these men. When Al Capone his brother Ralph got word of this, he and McGurn went to investigate and let Cantor know that those men did not work for them. With McGurn and Ralph Capone's help, Cantor played along with the fake gangster's con. And when these fake gangsters came to collect that $25,000 from Cantor, they were met with McGurn instead. After the extortionist realized they were in hot water with Jack McGurn, the dapper gangster said, I ought to take you two punks out in the alley and shoot you through the head, but that would cause too much heat. Here's your orders from up top. You're both to be out of town by eight o'clock tomorrow night. And after the extortionists left, McGurn told Cantor, you won't have no more trouble from them anymore, Mr. Cantor, so long. Jack McGurn, along with Frank Needy, who hated him, but again, more on this later, would become close with Capone. McGurn went nearly everywhere Al Capone did, even to sporting events. He was more than just a bodyguard. He was Al Capone's friend and confidant. With his improved status and increased pay, McGurn would become part owner in the Green Mill Speakeasy on 4802 North Broadway, smack dab in the middle of Capone's mortal enemy, Bugs Moran's territory. This cocktail lounge is still in business today. This was an extremely popular and lucrative business for the Southsiders and featured entertainers such as Charlie Chaplin, Eddie Cantor, Sophie Tucker, and Joe E. Lewis. McGurn had an interesting run with the entertainment industry. First, the incident with Eddie Cantor, and then an encounter with singer and comedian Joe E. Lewis, which, spoiler alert, was nowhere near as amicable as the run-in with Eddie Cantor. A rival tavern, the Rendezvous Cabaret, owned by the Northside Gang, where there is now a Panera Bread, pulled Joe E. Lewis from the Green Mill by offering him a high salary to play at their opening night. This would infuriate McGurn, who, in contrast to Cantor's experience, was a vindictive and brutal man. To add insult to injury, part of Lewis's November 2nd, 1927 act included making fun of McGurn to a packed crowd. The next morning, Lewis awoke in his posh Commonwealth hotel room to find three armed men, one of whom has been reported to be a young Sam Giancana, and these men beat him nearly to death, slicing his face and tongue with a hunting knife and beating him with a revolver. They left him for dead, but Lewis survived and was able to eventually make it back to the stage. But according to reports, his voice was never the same. Capone, who did not need the bad PR, was not a fan of violence toward innocent people, especially entertainers that made him so much money. Capone allegedly gave Lewis $10,000 for the trouble and promised him he wouldn't have to deal with McGurn again should he return to the Green Mill for a salary that matched the rendezvous offer. Despite Al Capone's frustration with Jack McGurn, the two would remain friends, and Jack McGurn, who would go on to have 22 murders under his belt, would save Al Capone multiple times from attempted hits. McGurn's most notable kills include the murder of two O'Donnell gang members and the accidental murder of an Illinois state attorney, Jaime Weiss, and of course, the victims of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. In 1926, Chicago was in the midst of what could be known as the Beer Wars, in which rival bootleggers would undercut one another on the price of beer. As with most things related to the Chicago outfit in this time, it turned violent. The O'Donnell Gang, associated with the Northsiders, not to be confused with the West Side O'Donnell Gang, had been undercutting the South Side Gang on a regular basis, and Capone had had enough. He sent his man, Jack McGurn. McGurn, armed with his Tommy gun, wiped out two O'Donnell members, and accidentally, Illinois State Attorney William McSwiggin. Again. While this killing pushed the O'Donnells out of the beer trade, 
It also created a media firestorm for the outfit. Capone, Needy, and McGurn would have to lie low for a few months following this accidental murder, but they wouldn't stay out of trouble for long. By October, it was already time to exact more revenge. Weiss, who had attempted to have Capone killed, then refused a peace deal, was shot dead outside of his headquarters on October 11, 1926, by Jack McGurn. After Jaime Weiss's murder, Bugs Moran would become the leader of the Northside Gang, and McGurn would simultaneously secure his spot as Al Capone's favorite and the primary target of the Northside Gang. In 1927, Jack Zuda, a racketeer under Capone, changed sides and began working with Moran instead. To intimidate their former associate, Jack McGurn would drive by and throw bombs from vehicles at Zuda. This actually started a brief bomb war in 1927, but by early 1928, Zuda was fed up. He hired a hitman, Isidore Goldberg, to take out McGurn, but McGurn killed Goldberg before he had the chance to get the upper hand. After this, Zuta hired the infamous Northside Frank and Peter Gusenberg brothers to get the job done. While McGurn was visiting a real estate operator, Nick Mastro, in the smoke shop in the McCormick Hotel on March 7, 1928, the Gusenbergs moved in for the kill. By the way, a real estate operator is somebody who makes their money by investing in real estate and trading in it, and so it's very likely that Mastro was connected to the Chicago outfit in some way. On that day, the Eusenberg brothers ran in and opened fire on McGurn and Mastro. One brother carried a Tommy gun, another carried a 45 automatic, but only the Tommy gun was fired. Mastro was injured, McGurn was nearly killed. Early reports would claim that McGurn was trapped in a phone booth while he was being shot, and while this makes for a great movie scene, it's not historically accurate. McGurn recognized the Eusenbergs and was taken to the hospital where he made a less than six week recovery from the gunshot wounds to the chest and arm. While in the hospital, the Chicago police asked McGurn if he knew who was responsible to which McGurn replied, of course I know who shot me. When I'm well again, I'll settle this thing myself. McGurn had not been out of the hospital long when the Gusenbergs attempted to kill him again on April 17, 1928. This time, McGurn was in his vehicle when a sedan of four men opened fire. McGurn jumped out of the vehicle and took cover. Eight bullet holes from a 45 automatic were left in the door of his vehicle and McGurn was uninjured. Some reports claim that this was actually ordered by the entertainer Joey Lewis, but that seems very unlikely. It's because of the prevailing theory that the Gusenberg brothers were responsible for the two attempted hits on McGurn that many believe McGurn was actually the mastermind behind the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and that the Gusenbergs were the primary target. And I know I did not cover this theory on my coverage of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but I knew we would be talking about it today. Ultimately, according to this theory, the call for the hit came from Capone, but at the behest of McGurn to murder the Gusenbergs, not for Capone to take out Moran. Jack McGurn is the primary suspect in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, despite his comment to the Chicago Tribune that the cops did it. According to this theory, McGurn convinced Capone that this would be a death blow to the North Side, and if that's true, then McGurn was absolutely right, and made sure that Capone had an airtight alibi by being in Florida on vacation at the time of the murder. This theory even holds that McGurn had his men repaint a 1927 Cadillac to look like a police cruiser so witnesses would believe the police were guilty. And according to witness testimony, the getaway vehicle was a police cruiser. Also, according to this assertion, Albert Weinshank was the last to enter the Clark Street garage, and the gunman mistook him for Moran. The seven victims were killed, and McGurn's prophetic promise to Capone that the North Side would lose all of their power came true. McGurn was charged for the massacre, but he was never brought to trial, due in no small part to his blonde alibi. McGurn had checked into the Stevens Hotel with his flapper girlfriend, Louise Rolfe. During the time of the massacre, McGurn claimed that he had been in bed with Rolfe all day on the 14th. And when questioned by police, Rolfe confirmed the story and implied that they were maybe doing a little bit more than sleeping. Because of this, the media dubbed Rolfe McGurn's blonde alibi. McGurn wasn't completely out of the woods on this alibi just yet, though. Because Rolf was unmarried, divorced actually, and McGurn had taken her across state lines, the law at the time held that this was a form of slavery. To avoid a slavery charge, McGurn divorced his wife Helen and became Louise Rolf's second husband. The beginning of the end for McGurn came with the end for Capone. After Capone's October 18, 1931 conviction for tax evasion and sentenced to 11 years in prison, Frank Needy took over as boss and McGurn was sent packing right away. Needy, it has been suggested, was jealous of the relationship between Capone and McGurn, and had problems with McGurn's drinking and his tendency to discuss top secret outfit related information while drunk. Needy was glad to be rid of his biggest rival and liability after he gained headship of the Chicago outfit. It was at this point that McGurn became a silent partner in the Evergreen Golf Course and began pursuing a career as a pro golfer. On August 25th, 1933, the Western Open Golf Championship began at Olympia Fields Country Club. McGurn entered the competition as Vincent Gabardi. In the opening round, McGurn scored a 13 over par 83 on course number four. The next morning, the Chicago police
police recognized the name Vincent Gabardi as an Americanized Vincenzo Gibaldi and sent two sergeants to arrest him. When the officers approached McGurn, they told him they had a warrant for his arrest. Louise McGurn rushed to her husband and the police, demanding, whose brilliant idea was this? McGurn kept a cooler head and asked the officers if he could finish his game first. The officers agreed to this, but despite McGurn's cool exterior, Having the officers there with the arrest warrant must have really troubled him. He ended the game with a 16 over par 86 for a 36 hole total of 169, 14 strokes above what he needed to get into the next level. Within three years, McGurn would lose everything he had built. McGurn was paranoid that he would be murdered. He had a long enemies list after all. He would even beg the Chicago police to protect him. Apparently, they did not oblige. On Valentine's Day night of 1936, seven years to the day after the St. Valentine's Day massacre, Jack McGurn had joined two of his friends for bowling at the Avenue Recreation Bowling Alley. He was there late, staying until after midnight. Three hitmen rushed into the bowling alley and fired machine guns into McGurn at close range. The photo suggests that he was hit from the back and received no wounds to the face. Jack McGurn was killed on February 15, 1936. The identities of the gunmen are unknown, although the prevailing theory is that these were Bugs Moran's men and that one of the gunmen may have been James Gusenberg, brother to the murdered Frank and Peter. If McGurn was left vulnerable, Moran, whose power was taken from him at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, would have every reason to kill McGurn and, more specifically, every reason to kill him on Valentine's Day. The other suspect, although less likely, is Frank Needy. Many have speculated that McGurn could not keep his mouth shut about the outfit operations, especially when drunk, and Needy took the opportunity to kill him. The Moran theory seems more likely not only on its face, but when you consider the mocking Valentine's Day card that was left at the scene of the crime. It said, you've lost your job, you've lost your dough, your jewels and cars and handsome houses, but things could be worse, you know, at least you haven't lost your trousers. These Chicago mobsters were not a poetic bunch, apparently, but they made their point. Vincenzo Antonio Gibaldi died a nervous wreck, having had his worst fear realized. His funeral did not reflect the status he had once known in the Chicago outfit. He was placed into a $1,000 casket and followed by a procession that included 27 vehicles filled with family and loved ones. Al Capone's family attended as well and placed a six foot tall pillar of white rosebuds and lilies at the head of the casket with a note from Al. It is actually unlikely that Al Capone was aware of McGurn's death at the time of the funeral. Vincenzo Antonio Gibaldi was buried at Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois on February 18th, 1936. He was only 33 years old. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Bracket Reviews discussing the famous yet mysterious Capone gunman whose life was a series of peaks and valleys. Given the trajectory of McGurn's life and the mystery surrounding it, I do think that the Jay Gatsby comparison is an apt one. Don't forget to let me know in the comments below or on Facebook or Twitter who you would like to see me covered next. I'm always happy to see who you're interested in knowing more about, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao!